Lynn Carpenter, Chief Executive of Thurrock Council. Last time we spoke was a year ago and we referred to your first 100 days. Now, over a year in, reflect on the, on the last year, how's it been? Um, it's a year next Monday exactly to the day I started. Um, and I have been thinking about what's gone well and where we still need to um, put some priority. I think the structure of the council and the responsiveness of the council is, uh, has improved although I still think we don't quite get um, all our responses to our customers right and we continue to work really hard on that. The senior restructure has worked really well and the subsequent um, work we've done around getting the right people into the organisation, we've appointed some really um, key people into the senior team and I've been really pleased about that. Uh, certainly some of the standards that we set out to achieve uh, around the environment are, are changing and we've reinvested back in, in that area. We're delivering a huge amount around um, the growth agenda and, and actually now moving from what has always been the talk of the six growth hubs more into conversation around placemaking. Which one of the things I talked to you a year ago, Michael, was around the fact that the borough is going to change, we know it's going to change, but it can't just change and be done to local people. It has to be with local people having an involvement in a say in what happens. <coughs> so I think some of that is moving in, in the right direction. Um, some of our priorities around um, our environment and open spaces, we are starting to get better at that, although we haven't had a particularly good summer and a good year in, in maintaining some of our parks and open spaces. We need to improve on on that. Um, we have had some very good feedback in a corporate peer review which is an external challenge where we bring people in from all across local government to look at what we've done. That happened in February and the feedback is that generally the direction of travel of the council is really positive compared to where we were four years ago and that's in the context of what we're doing for the local communities. The thing we really now need to work out is what is the council's clear priorities in supporting the borough in how we are going to change in the future. I'm going to go back to litter firstly, is it a bit of a, a Sisyphean task as they say in that the more you've drawn attention to the challenges and demands regarding litter, the more people, if I judge it by social media, you know, the more people seem to be unhappy. Is it almost an impossible task? How, how can you, do you feel you can convince people of Thurrock that actually you've got to, you're tidying the borough and then one day it's going to be tidy? I genuinely believe we can, um, but clean streets take three things. One is it takes the council to clean up and have a, a proper regime in place with resources to do that. The second is to get people to stop dropping litter um, and we need to convince local people uh, or whoever it is that it's not acceptable to, to drop litter on the streets. Uh, a huge number of our residents don't, but there are some that do. And we can do that in one of two ways. One is to encourage people to take pride in the place that they live in. And the other is to enforce uh, action against people who refuse to um, do what we think is the right thing for the borough. Without all three in place, you don't get that kind of long-term sustainability of a, of a better environment. So I think we've got about two of those. We haven't yet got all the enforcement side in place and we're looking at how we do that through um, cleaner, greener overview and scrutiny committee and getting some feedback. So I don't think it's um, a thankless task, I think it's something that's absolutely a priority. I quite frequently walk up and down the streets of the borough and uh, ask people to pick up litter that they've dropped on the floor and point out that actually it's much better to put it in the bin. And I think if I can do that then you know, it's something that we can all take a little bit of responsibility for. Going back a bit here, um, so over the last year or so, would you say there's a, a, diff a stylistic difference or a political difference between Graham Farron's Surrock Council and Lynn Carpenter's Surrock Council? I think under Graham, a lot of what um, happened was about putting the foundations in place and getting the structures right to improve from where Surrock Council was historically. And, and Graham should take a lot of credit for that. His senior management structure was very different in that he had um, directors with very clear bespoke specialities. And for the time that Thurrock was in, that was the right thing that was needed. We've now moved to a slightly different approach, which is that we are taking more of a corporate responsibility. So a smaller senior team, 
which financially is the right thing, but also having much more collective ownership across the piece. So it's not okay to say, well, I just work in housing, the only bit I'm concerned about is housing. Housing has uh, an impact in so many ways across so many other uh, service areas, and it's about making sure that we, we link up. The thing that I'm really passionate about is that residents shouldn't have to come into the council and find their way through the myriad of officers and structures that we have. We have got to make it easier for people to do business with us and get to the services that they need. So that's a kind of a, a, a building on what was there before, I think. And certainly now, we are absolutely focused on getting our commitment to the public realm sorted. Local people have a right to live in a nice place and if we are to attract businesses into the borough which creates job opportunities for local people then they're going to want to come somewhere where they feel that they've got a good public ground for the people who um, work for them, that there's good quality housing here, that if they are bringing people in the schools are good which as we know um, most of our schools are performing um, at least good and outstanding. So it's that whole kind of connected piece. We can't operate in isolation. Everything has, has an impact for what we're responsible for. Are you quite a tough boss? I think the word that people use is challenging, um, and I don't make any apologies about that. We get um, paid significant amounts of money from local residents, and we are public servants, and we're here to serve local people. And, Every corporate induction that we have, I stand up and speak to everybody who comes in. I want them to feel really enthused and motivated about working for Zara because I genuinely believe it's a, a fantastic organisation and the IIP um, results we had just recently, uh, which awarded us gold status again, demonstrates we are genuinely investing in our staff. So staff for me are critically important. But with that comes a bit of responsibility as well. We are here to provide services for local people. And actually, if we think going only halfway is okay, then we are failing the people that are really important here. I've noticed a pattern, and I might be wrong, and I may be it's being reflected in some of our stories regarding your relationship with organisations like Angling Water, Essex Police, your relationship with the, with the litter, um, mirrors in the housing, is that there's a lot of calling out, as they say in modern parlance, of, of what, I, what I call blaming other organisations. Is that... Even if you are right, and maybe you might say, yeah, we actually were right of Anglian Water, isn't that a dangerous set of um, emotions to display as a council? If we were calling out organisations and not taking responsibility for ourselves, then I could say that's probably a fair criticism. But likewise, I think it's fair that the public hold us to account to raise issues on their behalf with organisations <clears throat> that frankly should be providing services to us. And, and there's one of two ways of doing it. We generally would rather work in partnership and do joint resolution of problems, but there are times when um, organisations like Anglian Water are the only ones that can genuinely resolve the issue in Grays Park. We, we can't do it on our own. We need them to take responsibility for um, the issues down there. Sometimes action takes longer than we would like, but then it's, it's right that we hold them to account as well and, and put um, a reasonable amount of pressure on because that's what local people expect us to do. We can't resolve everything ourselves. Um, and I, I genuinely do believe that part of what we are doing is holding people to account and saying, well, you know, in, in, you mentioned mirrors and some of our housing partners. It, it is a, a situation where we ask them to provide a service and we pay them to do it. It's a bit like any of us going and purchasing something. There is a, a contract that goes with it and you expect a certain level of, of service. Generally speaking, I think we work well with, with all our partners. Um, we've got a very positive relationship with, with most of our um, service providers. But it's tough out there for everybody at this moment in time. The economic um, pressures don't just affect the council, they, f they affect everybody. And Essex Police, did you think they got it horrendously wrong on the man away? Yes, I did. Um, and we said to them we thought they'd got it wrong. And the police accepted that they'd got it wrong and they um, put out a public apology after the weekend acknowledging that. 
So on that one instance, I think there was a lot of learning to take from it. We've moved on from that quite significantly and the approach to deal with legal activity in the borough has changed and I think we've got a, a much more robust process in place. Um, that's been rolled out across Essex, so I think on behalf of local government across the Greater Essex area, we've all got a, a better outcome as a result of that. And I think local people felt that we held um, the police to account on that particular issue. I have to say though that subsequent to that weekend, um, things have changed quite dramatically. And um, the working relationship and the responsiveness where the police can use their powers, and again there is a, a fine line between what the police can and can't do, and we absolutely respect that, um, is about getting and striking that balance. And there is probably more, and there is more that we are doing as a council um, in dealing with illegal activity in the borough. It's that whole kind of sense about either taking responsibility ourselves or getting people to take responsibility for, for, for what's happening. Uh, the press release put out about the 100 days of the Tory, the Conservative run Farrah Council, and I know there are strict parameters, you know, between officers and members, etc. But uh, there was no real mention of the regeneration agenda. In fact, I got the sense that the whole press release was like coming from a, a parish stroke district council and not an ambitious 21st century borough, unitary borough council, you know, um, why was there no mention of, of the LEP or, or Perfleet, you know, all, all the big, big ticket regeneration All, all of those big um, items, big projects, um, very ambitious plans are all still very much happening. I think, and I wouldn't speak for the leader of the council and his portfolio holders, I'd let them speak for themselves, but very much the focus in those first 100 days was around the clean it uh, cut it, fill it, and that was, I think, what the administration wanted to focus on. In terms of the, the big regeneration schemes, and trying to get us to move away from talking about regeneration and into talking about pacemaking, which is about communities in the places that they live, um, Perfleet regeneration is absolutely on target. We will have a planning application in, in December this year, which is what we said. Um, the new school will be up and running by September 2019 um, with Harris Academy, which again is on target. There are plans um, being developed here in Greys as a result of the public consultation. Tilby work is ongoing, there is a development of new housing there, the Healthy Living Centre is progressing. So I, I don't think we could ever not focus on those elements of, of the borough. I think the 100 days was more a, sort of a time limited, this is going to be our initial focus. You just mentioned the um, new school, you know, that, um, in, and I, I know there, there must be restrictions in what you can interfere with or ask questions of, but one, somebody said to me that Harris will get their school in, in, in that part of the town, Gateway Academy applied for a second school, William Edwards have a plan for Orsett Heath Academy, there's a couple of, uh, have you ever asked yourself regarding this particular issue, where, A, is there a need for all these, you know, could have, what are we going to end up with, 12 secondary schools, and B, where are they going to get the teachers from, because, you, you know, I believe we've had education fairs and very, very little feedback. We know that the population of the borough is going to increase from what it is now at around about 160,000, probably up to 190,000 in the next few years, and possibly go over 200,000. A lot of the um, growth will be um, families who are here having children and also people who are moving into the borough with children. So all of those projections form part of the longer term strategy for school places um, and that is absolutely identified as um, clear need. So there is a lot of science and evidence that sits behind all of that. I think the point about attracting people into Thurrock is a really interesting one and I think we all recognise it's, it's a challenge in some respects, partly because um, travelling in and around the borough isn't as easy as we know, something happens on the M25, we get massive congestion and that can gridlock the borough for, for a number of hours. Um, that's got to change, it's something that we are looking at doing with, with partners. I think Thurrock is a really uniquely placed borough. It's very exciting. There is a lot going on here. There's a lot of businesses investing in the borough. And I think for people who look at Thurrock in terms of the affordability of housing, um, the fact that there's a lot of beautiful open spaces here, it's close to many major um, 
centres of, of work if people do need to, to travel. But I think fundamentally one of the conversations we're starting to have is we're, we're fixated as a nation about how do we get people in and out of London quicker and you know with more capacity. Part of the answer is actually we don't need to get people into London. We need to get people who live on the cusp of London to come out this way and to realise actually that there are, are huge opportunities in good quality jobs coming to the barn and not just what they might see as traditional um, low income jobs but um, middle and senior management, great opportunities, a lot happening in the borough. So actually it's about a mindset change and for me it's about making sure that people out there in our sector, teachers being one, planners, social workers, get a sense of what Thurrock is about and want to come and be part of, of what we're doing. The council can't do everything, can they? And there's only a couple more questions I have here. But And I know you're, you're an ex in netball international, so I know sport is, is very much part of your life. But isn't it, don't you find, because of that, you know, on Saturday the Thurrock Park run had the seventh lowest participation in the whole country, 45. You know, whereas you get some like, um, have as many as 1,200 people, Chelmsford 600. The, the one I do, Harlow, 100, 180, you know. Is, do you think that's somewhere along the line, that a borough of 160,000 people is the seventh lowest? Do you think there's something, you must notice things about sport and participation in the borough. Do you think Thurrock has... And especially in the Olympic legacy, as we keep calling it, you know, I um, think that has some way to go to get more people involved in, in healthier lifestyles. And what can the council do, if anything? Well, I don't think it's just a council issue. And I think when you think about sport, even though I'm a, 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 you know, somebody who's played sport at the highest level in, in, in two separate sports, it's all about providing opportunity in different ways. So we have three very good... Um, sports centres in the borough. Uh, they don't look particularly great from the outside but when you get in them the facilities and the quality they offer from Impulse Leisure I have to say are really good. But for lots of people just that physical going into a leisure centre is a barrier in itself. So that sort of ties back to the point I was making earlier about good quality um, parks and open spaces, walking the dog, um, feeling that they can go and play with their children in good quality playgrounds, all add to uh, opportunities for a healthier lifestyle. As part of the regeneration placemaking plans, and, and we're starting with Perfleet, opening up the river frontage, and the ambition is that we create um, cycle and walkways all along our 18 miles of river frontage. So giving people genuine opportunity to be able to move about the borough without the need to use a car. That's not gonna happen in just the short term, it will take a little bit longer. There are some um, fantastic um, clubs and sports and leisure organisations which sit outside the, the council structure, so very much in the voluntary sector, who provide really, really good opportunities here. I think um, we can do more about the general promotion of health and wellbeing. It doesn't just have to be sports related, it's a whole range of, of different things. We're actually about to have um, a conference coming up in, I think it's a couple of weeks' time, which links in the physical environment with the health and wellbeing agenda and the things that we are responsible for under the, the broader context of public health. Um, you know, working with improving GP facilities with the NHS and all our um, CCG colleague providers is equally as important. So there's not just one thing that will, will fix it all. Um, we know we've got some um, current and previous Olympians in the borough and I'm sure we will potentially have some Paralympians and, and future athletes. But it's about creating opportunities for people to, to feel as fit as they, they want to. Just one final question on the budget. It must be a challenge how, you know, with, with, the, with the restrictions etc and further cuts to come and, 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 and therein and you've got a budget setting which will be in February, March etc. How, how hard are things and, and you know, are, you, are you pessimistic about the challenges that you face? I'm not pessimistic. Um, I wouldn't say I'm um, optimistic in terms of being unrealistic but I think we've got a, a challenge ahead of ourselves. What we've done this year is um, try to, again, because of the structure of the council now, is working much more collaboratively across the piece. We've got a number of significant projects underway, which is looking at how we um, manage demand in some particular services, how we have earlier intervention and prevention agendas, and lots of authorities talk about it, Michael, but actually doing it is, is quite challenging. Um, 
we are looking again at our whole property base and whether we're using our physical infrastructure as well as we can do. I don't think we are yet, so there are some real opportunities there. We absolutely know that the only money we will have to spend are the things that we can raise ourselves. So through council tax, business rates and anything that we can generate our own income from. So a lot of the strategies that are in place are around those particular three three strands and it all links back. Businesses aren't going to want to come to Thurrock if it's not a great place. They can't do business with the council. They don't feel that it's a, a, a good environment to, to be situated within. Still enjoying it? Do you know what? I get up every morning and I genuinely um, look forward to coming to work because for everybody there are challenges within, within a work environment. But it's the little things. When you do something that you can see makes a difference to somebody's life, that is what really um, motivates me. Um, I've started to do a series of ward visits again. So when I first started, I looked around the borough. This year, I'm going out with ward councillors in every single ward uh, in the borough and getting them to take me to residence houses. We've been into shops which have got challenges. And for me, that's how you really get a sense of what's working and what's not working. And whilst we're a big organisation, we need to be able to respond to what really matters to people who live in, in the borough. So, yes, it, it's challenging, but yes, I absolutely feel blessed that I'm able to do um, this, this job. Lynn Carpenter, thank you very much.